take power. <clears throat> Does that look okay? Yeah. <clears throat> uh, so, hello, my name is Eric Palmer. Um, I'm a software innovation engineer here at NERSC. Um, part of what I do is work on the programming environments and models. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about programming environments and compilation. Um, and uh, you know, every everybody has like kind of their own specific application. So today, what I'm going to try to do is just sort of give you a general floor of a lot of different things. And some things you might find really helpful. Some things might not apply to you. But hopefully, through all this information, you find some things that are useful. Um, and if you have questions, uh, there's the Q and A docs. Uh, we have people who can help you answer them there. And anything else, I'll be looking at it afterwards to answer more specific questions. Um, that my next slide. So the first step with with you know NERSC is you've logged on to Perlmutter. And the next question is now what do you do, right? Uh, so you can get to the command line, you can get to the terminal, but what are you going to do with it? And so most of what you're going to work with next is software. And there's essentially four main ways of getting software into your user environment. The first one is loading modules. Another one is working with containers. And another one is getting source code, like either from GitHub or GitLab, downloading that and compiling it, and then running, turning that into an executable you can run. And the third one are some um, package managers that are, you know, back in E4S is things you might have heard less of, but Conda is a package manager, like a package manager too, that works similar to back in E4S. Uh, so that gives you some sense of what, what we're talking about here. Um, today, I'm really going to focus more on loading modules and compiling from source. Uh, for the time, I'll, I'll briefly mention SPAC and E4S. So first is uh, the module system. So here's the example. You've logged into Perlmutter. Okay, so you've logged into Perlmutter. You're at this command prompt. If you check Python version, if you type this out right now, you're going to get Python 2.7. Do you want Python 2.7? Python, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Most people probably don't want Python 2.7. So you're just going to say, well, how do I get to Python 3, right? And, um, you know, is it even available on the system? Do I have to install it myself? Like, how do I do this? And with modules, what we have is a whole set of modules that you can just a pre-installed software that you can just load into your environment and make it available to you. So the second command that I list here is module list. That lists the currently loaded modules into your environment. And so if you just log in, you'll see there's several modules that are already modifying your environment. Some of these are making um, sort of libraries that are needed for our NPI to work properly. Some of these are math libraries. Some of these are the create programming environment, which does a lot of configuring in the background itself. Um, but you notice Python, are Python 3, 3 modules not listed here. So I look at this list, I realize that Python's not there. I type module load Python in the version slash 3.11, and that's going to load Python 3 into my environment. If I then type module list to show the modules that are loaded into my environment, you're going to see down here that now it shows Python 3.11. And now if I type Python dash dash version, I'm going to get Python 3.11. So that's just a quick example how to use a module to get some software that you need for your work into your user environment. There are a lot of modules available. Um, this slide is maybe a little bit dated. Um, there might be more. Um, you know, so the probably the, the first easiest way to get the software you want into your environment is find out if there's a module for it and load the module. If not, then you probably want to look at some other ways to use. Um, when you log into the Perlmutter, like the modules that are loaded by default, like I said, there's a whole array of these. They all have to do slightly different things. Again, I'm pointing out here that this CreatePE x86 Milan, that is specifying the CPU architecture. So when you do some compilers, the compiler wrapper is going to look at that for that module and then do optimization specifically for that processor because that module is loaded. Uh, the ones in red here are specific to the compiler, right? So we're using this programming environment. GNU is going to use the GCC compiler. The green ones here relate to GPUs, right? Again, some specific 
settings for uh, customized acceleration for our GPUs and some other settings for GPU and that GPU flash 1.0. All right, so if you are looking with modules and you're working with modules, how do you do it? Well, these are the most common commands, right? So module list is the one I already showed you. It shows what modules that are currently loaded in the system. You can load and unload modules out of your environment using module load and unload. Uh, module swap may be one that people have seen before. Um, if you already have one module loaded and you want to change it for another, you can just say module swap. Uh, module show, I'm going to give you an example of that on the next slide. This shows you what the module is actually doing to your environment. If you want to look kind of under the hood and see what's going on. And if you want a comprehensive way to search for modules, I suggest module spider. Um, oh, oh, whoa. Oh, okay. Uh, I put these cool tricks here. I'm not going to talk too much about these, but I'll let you check them out and, and for yourself and, and see. Um, this first one is just a nice way to search the results of Spider. The second one is just some shortcuts that you can use if you get tired of typing all that stuff. And as always, uh, on these slides, there's a lot of bottom lines here that say if you need more information, I suggest you follow those things. Okay, so I talked about module show. So for example, we're, if we're looking at this module create HDF5, if I were to load this into my environment, how would it change my environment? And if you type module show, it'll show you what is happening. So what we have here at the top of each module is we have a sort of a set of, um, I'm going to use the wrong word for this, commands, um, parameters for the module that kind of tell it how it should interact with other modules on the system and whatnot. You know, some like, you know, what it is, help, those type of things. The second one is where it prepends your path. So if you type So, so what this means is like sometimes I have installed software where I just go onto my terminal and I type it and I can just run it. So for example, like that Python example, right? That means that the Python executable is in my path, right? And so if I moved it into a different location that wasn't in my path, if I type Python, it wouldn't work. So I don't have an example of that here, but this is just kind of explaining what it means by changing your path. That's it, changing what is the amount immediately available when you're just typing things on the command line. And so these are just some environment variables that you figure that, and that's what's changing here. So you can see we're adding, we're adding paths to specific locations. We're also setting environment variables, telling, so for example, if you were using a piece of software that was looking for, create, uh, for HDF5, it might search for this environment variable HDF5 dir, and so, you would look here and see, oh, is this variable set? And then it would go to this location. So that's kind of what the modules are doing to your user environment to change things and customize it for you. Um, but again, you know, you can always go back to that first example with Python where I just need Python 3, I just load it and I go from there. This is just showing you what's going on under the hood. So the next thing, maybe uh, you, you should keep checking Charles. I got you. Um, the next thing is talking more about programming environments and starting about to compile code. Um, and I should say, compiling code is mostly a C++ Fortran C type of thing. Uh, but there are situations in Python more and more where you have Python C bindings where there are things going on in the hood where it's compiling a package. You have to troubleshoot a little bit. So it is still helpful to know how, how the configurations that work with compilers on our system. Um, so this is the slide that says, like, you may know. I, I have to admit, when I first started, I didn't know. So uh, hopefully, maybe for, for people out in Zoom land or people here, this is somewhat relatable. But the example here is, like, if I'm on my home machine and I wanted to compile something, if you were learning, you know, you may have just started with GCC. All right, I'm compiling my first C code. I do GCC, hello world. I tell it, dash O. I want hello world EX to be my output, and it compiles. But this is not going to be MPI enabled code. And we at a supercomputing center want MPI enabled code because we want to use lots of different clusters, lots of different CPUs in different parts of the machine all together to do our problems. So if you're going from your home machine, which is a single machine, to your home cluster, maybe at your institution, you may have done something more like MPI CC, right? So now the MPI is baked into that compile code, and then it's going to compile your hello world C code, right? with MPI libraries to allow it to communicate between the different CPUs on the system, or the different nodes on the system. 
So that might be something you're familiar with. Now, when we come to Perlmutter, it's a, it's a, I'm not sure if it's HPE Cray or, or Cray HPE anymore. HPE Cray. It's an HPE Cray system. So it has this uh, Cray program, HPE Cray programming environment. And so that's going to work slightly different. Instead of using this MPICC as your compiler wrapper, because this is, uh, I won't say too much about what this is doing in this way, we're going to use CC. So I use this. With the called CC, they call the compiler wrapper, and it works in conjunction with your programming environment. So I first set my programming environment to GNU. I'm going to type CC, hello world, do this line, and now I'm going to get a bunch of optimizations in the background for our systems. Your code is going to run as fast as it can. You're going to get all the MPI libraries so that they communicate between different processes and do your science as fast as possible. So at Perlmutter, when you're compiling code, you're looking to do this last setup here. If you see these things in your code, it might work. <laughs> but if you want me to fix it, the first thing I'm going to look for is how to set it up like this. Okay. Um, this is showing you a little bit more about what those Cray compiler wrappers are doing behind the scenes. All right, so I've got the same, uh, I got a slightly different CC command. I've got capital CC here, but it works the same way as lowercase CC. And if I add this flag to that compile line, this create PE dash verbose, it's going to tell me all the things that are going on when I use this compiler wrapper. So what this wrapper is actually doing, the reason we call it a wrapper is because inside of it, it calls um, G++. Right? And so it also wraps a bunch of other things up in there. We also have our MPI library, this mpitch. They're the one that works the best on our system. Uh, the second one, it also includes is, there, is our Cray libsci package, which is our you know math uh, linear algebra math package, right? So those are all included automatically when you use CC. So if I'm using CC, I don't want to specify these things. I want to just let the wrappers take care of it. It does a lot. I'm not going to go into everything, um, but the idea is it's supposed to help you make your life easier. And most of the time, I find that it, it does. Another thing you can do, like I said before, is be working in conjunction with the programming environment, right? So I've got module load programming by NVIDIA, and now when I type CC, you see I'm getting the NVC++ compiler. So that wrapper is the line, the second line is going to stay the same now. In the second example, if I do program environment Intel, the second line stays exactly, the second line staying exactly the same, but this time now it's going to use the Intel compiler. Right. And you notice the flags inside of these, these automatically included flags, are also going to change to adjust for each compiler. So that's why it can be helpful for you. You know, you run the same compile line, you load different programming environments, you can try this one, find out which one works the best with the code. This is a table just to keep for later. You know, depending on what programming environment you're in, this is what compiler you're going to get. So, like I showed you, switching between these things, you use the same wrapper for each one, and then you get a different compiler depending on what's in the programming, uh, what's loaded for your module here. The MPI library, again, that we recommend is going to be create in pitch, and you're going to want to keep that the same um, the whole time, unless you're doing something that's specifically studying uh, open MPI. Okay. Um, I kind of alluded to this, but depending on what modules you have loaded, uh, a lot of things will implicitly link. I mean, you won't see them on the link line, but they'll be behind the scenes being linked inside the compiler wrapper, such as MPI, uh, linear algebra, pack, BLAS, follow pack, and more. If you have other modules loaded, such as create HDF5, create FFPW, right? If you've loaded those into your module bar, they'll also get included automatically. So you don't have to worry about even, you don't have to worry about modifying that compile line. You can still use that same CC line you saw on the last slide. Um, and always, for more information, I recommend, you know, if you want to get really snazzy and be the person who knows all the secret information, it's here in the manual file. When you use these commands, man, intro, libsci will tell you all the secret stuff about the create libsci library. And also lots of other things. So um, learning how to search those and use those can be really helpful, like the original Google. Uh, the next thing you may encounter, so this is where we get to like you, now you basically you know the basic idea behind compiling, but most of you are not going to be compiling Hello World. Most of you are going to be encountering bigger, more complex systems where you are compiling lots and lots of different files together. When you have that, you usually have a build system. And the two, you know, these are often called uh, 
you know, one of them is called CMake. Another one is often called Auto Tools Make, or even is I having here listed as AutoConf. Um, but I think here to have Auto Tools or Make Files, like that's much more common to hear for that. But this is essentially a build system which is going to tell you how to compile a whole bunch of files together to make one complex executable. Now, in our system, we want to use the create compiler wrapper. So if you take a, a make file or build system that's written for your home computer and you just run it on our computer, it might not function the way you want it to. So you have to tell it, I don't want for your uh, C compiler, I want it to use this Cray compiler. And the way I do it is with this command, cc equals the money sign says run this command, give me the output, and feed it to cc. Same thing with this one. This is for my C++ compiler. I'm setting it to use this. And then for FC, I'm setting it to use the, the Cray wrappers for the Fortran compiler. If you're running a configure step, you know, it looks similar. Uh, sorry, the first line is what I've seen typically used for CMake. Um, you know, maybe it's not as needed now, but if you run into trouble, it might be helpful. Uh, but this one is much more common if you're using auto tools and make files. So we do a configure step where you have to set what each compiler is supposed to be on this step. And again, more information in the docs below. Um, this is the example. So I was looking at this file as code called slate. I look at the readme, and right here it's saying create a make.inc file. So I know for this code, I'm probably going to have to go in and specify CXX, it should be what? Anybody remember? I don't have goals. This is a live question. Any guesses? I think you have a guess. I can go back. Or even back further there. Okay. So we've got MTICC, and I said we want to do that one. So if I go forward, and I've got MPI CXX, probably one, the one for CXX. So what's the compiler wrapper for C++? Oh, it's on the screen. That's why I read <laughs> <laughs> uh, Okay, read the slides, right? Okay, so I've got CXX here. What I want to do is I want to make sure that I specify in this make.ink file that it's capital CC, right? Or Sometimes the configure step will help you build the file, so that you can do it the other way too. But, but this is telling me that this code, I'm going to have to be careful to make sure that these things are set to the right. Um, this is just a, like a tip and trick for if you're working with CMake. CMake also has this interact, I mean, it's called the, the terminal flavor GUI. Uh, but instead of typing CMake dot dot, which you might see in some directions, you can type CC make dot dot, and it'll give you this graphical interface where you can see all the settings being done by CMake. So if you're having trouble getting your thing to compile, you can run this and verify what, what things CMake is picking up as the C compiler or the C++, X, the C++ compiler or other aspects of your build system. So that can be really helpful. Uh, two quick comments about linking. Um, like I said, modules pre uh, also modify not only your path, but your library path. So a lot of times if you have like, so for example, if you want to compile GSL, you don't have to tell the location of these libraries. The modules already take care of that, so you can just link them. Um, I'll, I'll leave this comment for the minute, dynamic and static and off. But, um, it, the point is, if you get this error while loading your libraries, it means that you have dynamically linked libraries. Um, and usually that's kind of the default case now. Most people aren't doing static, um, which is good because it's not necessarily Okay, so summary slide, uh, best practices for compiling code on Perlmutter. Uh, use the system compiler wrappers, uh, lowercase cc for C, capital CC for C++, and FTN for Fortran. Um, if you're using a build system, auto tools or CMake, uh, make sure that the compiler wrappers are pointing to the system compiler wrappers and, and you will avoid many, many problems. Um, where am I? So about two minutes. Um, the next thing I have are just some, some examples of compiling code. Um, so this code is something I randomly pulled off the internet. Uh, it looked good to me. Uh, this is my attribution slide. So thank you to uh, RCC U Chicago. <laughs> <laughs>
But no, this is a great this is a great hello world example, right? So what I've got here is I've got code that is basically hello world from different threads and processes. So this is an MPI enabled code, but it's also an open MP enabled code. So I've got all the parallelism going on in the same example, which is probably too much for the first example. But we're just we're not worried about writing this code and understanding it. We're just worried about what my compile line needs to be to give it the parallelism. Um, so speaking of compiling, here are some flags that you might find helpful if you're compiling. Uh, so these are default optimization levels. Sometimes you can get your code to run faster just by changing the flag in the compile line. So if you see these things like .o fast, that's what they're trying to do. Um, sometimes this can cause code to be a little less stable. So if you're having trouble, sometimes it helps to revert back to something smaller. The thing to point out here is if you know you need open MP threaded parallelism, you need to add a flag. Um, that wasn't always the case here at NERSC, but on Perlmutter, it definitely is. Um, if you know you're doing ACC for parallelism, that's for NVIDIA, that's the flag there. Uh, if you're debugging your code, that's dash G, right? That'll do debug symbols so you can go in and figure out what's actually going on. And also the dash V for verbose tells you what the compiler is doing uh, to make it helpful for troubleshoot issues. So those are some helpful settings. Um, you probably won't need most of these <laughs> in this thing now, but it's helpful to know this information. Uh, so what I have on the next slide is an example of compiling that open that MPI and open MP code. And no, let's see what I did. So I've got my I've got my hello hybrid code. These are the modules I've loaded. Um, you can see they're mostly just the default setup if you look closely. Um, and then I'm trying to this is me writing out the compile line. Now this is example. In this example, I want to use not only MPI because I get MPI automatically when I'm using the wrapper, but I also want OpenMP set of problems. So I had to add that flag. So I wrote that care that flag that highlighted in green part tells me to compile successfully. Now I'm doing the settings I need to run an open MP code, and I also have to put the caveat, oh, this one shows it clearly this time, that I'm on a compute node. I'm not running on a login node. So that's why I'm using srun to run my code. And you can see I get my, I've got multiple processes and multiple threads. And because of the way I did my video, I had no way to pause it. So um, I encourage you, if you're interested in seeing this, I encourage you to go back and watch the video where you can pause and see each step. Uh, this is an example for CUDA code. So the similar, this is going to be similar in most of the modules. Um, I wanted to point out if I'm, I'm doing GPU and I want CUDA where MPI, which you need to have the CUDA GPU uh, module loaded. Uh, this will set some settings that allow you to do CUDA where uh, MPI. Um, in this slide, I'm just doing another another example of how to compile. CUDA code with the uh, create compiler wrapper. So um, what you're gonna see is it's just a few source code, a few source code files. Um, I think there's a library in there. No, there's a header file, there you go. And I want to compile those into an, all those into an executable. So I've got my, my CUDA file with the .cu, I've got a C++ file that's being combined into it. And then it's an example. You can see I have GPU loaded. You also notice I'm now using the NVIDIA programming environment. I switched out of the GNU one because I want to compile that CUDA file. And so my compile line is a CC, the output is the vector add. I'm linking in this hardware location library that my, my code needs. And then I'm giving it the source, source code file that I want to compile. So it's compiled. And now I try my srun command. And again, I, I kind of hit it here, but I'm also again I'm on a I'm on a compute node, not a login node. So this is so in this example kind of shows that each uh, thread, each process can see uh, which GPU it's assigned to. So it kind of gets cut off. But again, if you want to go through that with a microscope, I suggest going back to the video later. Uh, here are more resources on compiling code. I've found myself when compose when it works, it's really nice. If it doesn't work, everyone is a unicorn. Almost so, you know. I suggest like looking through some of these resources. Hopefully, they have things that can point you in the right direction. Um, and especially recommend the first one is a good place to start. Um, we also support a wide range of coding model uh, programming models. 
Um, here's a slide uh, with a bunch of them. Hit OpenMP, you think, well, these are all just ways to different programming languages with different programming features, which allow you to bring in parallelism in different ways. Um, so this slide just gives you a taste of some of that. Um, next thing is, okay, you've done your code, you've compiled it, where do you put it? This is a nice slide to kind of give some hints for that. Um, it's probably oversimplified, um, but it goes through uh, some stuff that was discussed yesterday, your home directory, your scratch directory, global common uh, community. And in terms of performance, you know, we said home is not optimal. If you really want your code to run as fast as possible, scratch is a really good place. If your code is too big for scratch, then, then you're looking at sort of global common. Um, again, if you're doing software for your entire project, this is also a good place to install your software so everybody in your project can use it. Um, and then the community sort of gives me a performance, so for sure get in there. So hopefully this slide kind of gives a quick summary. Um, so I would you think, Charles? Do you want to do this? I'm good to go. Okay. So, so I'm going to briefly introduce Stack and, and E4S um, together. And I'm going to confuse everybody because everyone's going to think that Stack and E4S are the same thing. And they're really close. <laughs> but they're a little bit different, and I'll try to explain. Um, so Stack is, is essentially works kind of like a package manager. It works really great on your local workstation. It's a little bit, um, the, the experience is not quite as smooth on Perlmutter yet. So the way you install it is you can get clone the source code like this. You source this script into your environment, and it then configures Stack to install packages. So if you want to use that to install a package that's included in Stack, you can say Stack install the package. And theoretically, it should just work. And I shouldn't say, like, on my personal workstation, it, it, it's pretty good. On Perlmutter, it's also pretty good, but Perlmutter is a much more complex machine with specific specializations, which makes it harder for Stack to always get it right. So if it works, great. But if it doesn't work, it can be more difficult to troubleshoot. So this gives you a way to access a bunch more packages and get them installed into the system. E4S is a special, um, oh, what's the word? A curated software stack for extreme scale scientific software. And what these E4S codes have been done is they've gone around and said these codes are kind of held to a higher standard to be included in the software stack. And they're tested on our systems uh, more than the other software in fact. So if you're picking packages out of E4S to use on our computer or use on our machine, you should expect a better experience. E4S uses stack to distribute its software. So I said Stack, you can install packages. Well, you can also, all the E4S software comes through Stack. So on our system, the way you get to that is you do module load E4S, and that brings you to, that brings you into a Stack environment. It's loading you into a pre-installed, pre-configured Stack environment. And I didn't, I thought I was going to skip this slide, to be honest, so that's why uh, I didn't update it. But there's a, quite a few packages that are installed this way, and you can also install more. Um, these are all the commands you need to start finding packages that are available here, right? You, you load E4S, I load the specific environment that I'm looking for, in this case it's CUDA, and then I can find different uh, codes, AMRX shows up first, ArborX, Caliper, and so on, uh, that I can install into the system. Uh, the stack has a lot, E4S has a lot, uh, so that you can get a lot of codes and things into your system. Um, but uh, I'm going to skip this example. Sorry. Um, and I'm going to move down to my final slide. So, programming environments and compilation best practices. First one is module spider to find your modules, compiler wrappers, a capital CC, lower CC, and FDN with the programming environment modules, verifying, you know, CMake and auto, verifying, verifying CMake builds are doing the right thing with CCMake. Um, I also always recommend the man files, you know, for like the, that intro to MPI, that's another one. Um, this is kind of a side tip. There's, if you're looking for software and you're having trouble, you do this some examples of scripts of how the software is compiled at this location. And always, um, you know, when it doesn't work, it can be really difficult and complicated to fix. So don't feel bad to send us a help to get at help that nurse address. With that, I will stop. Nice. Thanks.
Awesome. Any questions for Eric, either in the room or online? Question on Zoom and Google Doc being answered. You want to read them or? There's no, uh, there's a particular question on compiler. Okay. Oh, it's okay. I can, I can answer that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Keep, yeah, keep asking questions. Either on mute or on the Google Doc. And it's totally okay if you have like a question that's only specifically related to your special situation. Because when it comes to building software, I feel like that's what's common. And it can apply to multiple situations most of the time, too. So. Yeah, general questions are okay, too. Yeah. Is all this information in the nurse documentation, or can we get a copy of these slides? The slides are going to be posted on the event webpage. The ones from yesterday are already up, and all most of our stuff is on in our documentation. It is very exhaustive, um, so we try to pull the most useful information out um, for the trainings. But every um, all of these uh, the points are on our nurse documentation. Thank you. There is a question I'm doing right now. Uh, which one did you say was the preferred option? There were four rows in a table. Yes, it's oh, preferred to yeah, table. Google always. Sorry, it's a, it's a common thing to ask. Sorry. Um, and I said this in the in the previous thing. So if I'm looking at this table of compilers or libraries, you're like, well, which one do I use? Um, and this table is strategically arranged to suggest that you start at the top. Uh, unless you know that you're doing GPU codes. So if you need if you're doing GPU codes. Uh, start with program environment NVIDIA. Otherwise, if it's non GPU, I recommend you start with the programming GPU environment. Uh, if your code is not working there, then try the Intel environment, then try the Cray environment. Or if you just want to see if you can get it to work with the other compilers again, start from the top, get it working there, then get it working here, then get it working here. There are more programming environments listed on our docs if you want to try more experimental stuff. Um, but I would say these ones here cover. I would want to say 95, 97%, um, with the first one probably covering more than half by itself. Uh, and then GPU codes, this is the one I start with. Does that help? Yeah. Thank you.